Hola amigos, ¿qué tal? Stuart here from Spain Speaks with the Spain News Update. And the second transport workers strike for 2022 has started, but apparently turnout is lower than expected. But more about that in just a moment. Firstly, a big thanks to all of the people that left comments on the last video. Lots of comments, lots of debate happening there as usual. Thanks to people that supported the channel by buying merchandise. And a big thanks to my patrons on Patreon for your continuing support. Now, let's get into the news. And as I said, the second transport workers strike for 2022 here in Spain has kicked off. The first one was back in March, which brought various sectors here in Spain to a standstill because they couldn't get their goods onto supermarket shelves. But the turnout for this latest strike, according to all reports, is lower than expected. As we can read here, the transport workers strike gets off to a slow start with a low turnout and minimal incidents. The indefinite nationwide stoppage in freight transport called by the platform in defense of the transport sector has barely had any follow-up since it began last midnight and until 10 o'clock this morning. Traffic on the roads has been as usual for a Monday and the activity of the pickets has hardly been noticed. According to the information provided by the various government delegations of the autonomous communities, activity in the large wholesale fresh produce markets such as Merca Madrid and Merca Barna has also been as usual, and there have been no problems with the entry of lorries. The normality on the roads and supply centres contrasts with the serious incidents, even violent ones, that occurred during the previous strikes last March. To prevent incidents, the government has ordered a heavy police deployment with more than 50,000 officers guarding the major roads. So the transport workers strike has started today with low participation according to government delegations around the country and not resembling the last strike which took place in March as we saw in that article where violent incidents were recorded. So let's hope this strike continues to be fairly low profile and we don't get the disruptions that we had earlier in the year. Now a couple of hundred thousand people took to the streets yesterday in the capital Madrid to demand better public health care. As we know, according to a lot of people that live in Madrid, the public health system here is broken and a lot of citizens have said enough is enough. As we can read here, a massive demonstration calls for better public health care in Madrid and against the USO's management. Health is not for sale, they say. Thousands of people have walked through some of the main streets of Madrid this Sunday waving white scarves to denounce the critical state of the public health in the community and show their rejection of the plan for out-of-hospital emergencies of the president, Isabel Diaz Ayuso, whom they have asked to resign. Madrid's healthcare system is in a critical state. We have gone from applause during the pandemic to oblivion. Monica, a nurse who has traveled to a tocha dressed in uniform and carrying a banner, told RTVE.es to join a demonstration that she considers necessary. She says that she is one of those affected by the Madrid government's new plan and that she received notification of her new destination at three o'clock in the morning by email, a center where there was no doctor. We have different and complementary professions and we cannot offer the same care, she said. So the Madrid public health system, according to the people that hit the streets yesterday in dire straits, but the president of the Madrid community, Ms. Diaz Ayuso, does not agree. In fact, she's come out today and said that 99% of people that live in the Madrid autonomous community don't agree with the protesters. And stubborn is an adjective that comes to mind when talking about Ms. Diaz Ayuso. Now time for a missing persons alert. Apparently a British rugby player has gone missing in Barcelona and his parents are desperate to find him. As we can read here, the search for Levi Davis, the rugby player and X Factor star missing in Spain. Police in the Spanish region of Catalonia have opened an investigation into the disappearance of Levi Davis, a British rugby player and former X Factor contestant who went missing in Barcelona on October the 29th. His mother, Julie Davis, travelled to Barcelona to try to track her son down. She explained that the 24-year-old was going through a rough patch, struggling to find success in either of his great passions, rugby and music. For some time, he had been asking her for money. When he gained popularity, he was approached by people who might have had ulterior motives. And my son trusts people too much, Julie Davis told El País. And we'll put a picture of Levi on the screen now. So if you come across him in your travels here in Catalonia or any other part of Spain for that matter, please get in contact with the police. Now, anyone thinking of opening up a business here in Spain might want to read the following article. Because as we can read here, one out of every five companies set up in Spain does not even last 12 months. 
Around 20% of the companies that are set up in Spain do not survive even one year, while of those that manage to survive the difficult business infancy, only 45% manage to continue operating five years after their birth. This reality, reflected in the business demographic statistics published this week by the National Statistics Institute, places Spain as the sixth country in the European Union with the lowest survival rate of its companies, only behind Lithuania, Denmark, Latvia, Estonia, Malta and Portugal, and below the average for the continent, according to Eurostat data. Specifically, in Spain, of every 100 companies that were created in 2015, only 45 remained active in 2020, and after their first year of activity in 2016, 23 had already had to close, according to the INE. So be careful before you sink your hard-earned euros into a business adventure here in Spain, with 20% of all new companies disappearing after the first year. Now, Prime Minister Pedro Sánchez is again talking up the Spanish economy, saying that it is in good shape currently, and that the country has solid foundations to overcome this crisis with guarantees. The president of the government, Pedro Sánchez, assures that Spain has solid foundations to overcome this crisis with more guarantees, thanks to the European funds and the reforms that the government has set in motion. So much so that he expects the country country's growth to end the year above 4% and to be one of the highest in the European Union. Looking ahead to 2023, we will grow at a slower rate, but with positive GDP rates, he points out. Sanchez, in an interview with the newspaper La Vanguardia, affirms that there is a structural change in the quality and stability of employment with 84% of those affiliated to the Social Security with an indefinite contract and the lowest temporary employment rate in recent decades, especially among young people. For all these reasons, he believes that Spain will continue to create jobs. With regard to the criticism of the management of the Next Generation Funds, the President recalls that Spain has already requested the third disbursement of the transfers. According to him, we are the country that is deploying them the fastest. So, if it is said that we are slow, imagine the rest. He also explains that neither Spanish nor European bureaucracy is the bottleneck, but rather that EU competition policy is adapting in record time to a new industrial reality, hence the requirements. So, there we go. According to Prime Minister Sanchez, everything is rosy when it comes to the economy and job creation here in Spain, and that European Union recovery funds are being spent quickly and not slowly, which is what the opposition here in Spain alleges. So Mr. Sanchez, always the optimist. Now let's have a look at some of the comments from previous videos. One here from Larry, I enjoyed the previous video of Albacete. It seems like a city with a high quality of life and likely lower cost of living compared to larger cities. How would you compare to Ciudad Real, which seem to offer the same benefits? Both are on the high-speed train routes, which is fantastic. Yeah, Larry, thanks for the comment and glad you enjoyed my recently published video of the city of Albacete, which is in the autonomous community of Castilla-La Mancha here in Spain. And you're right, it is a city with a high quality of life and a lower cost of living than other big cities here in Spain. In fact, for me, it's an example of an almost perfect city here in Spain, a city with less than 200,000 people but has all of the services that you need, well connected by train and road to other important cities in this country, for example, example Madrid and Valencia, and it's an extremely flat city which makes getting around very easy indeed. And when it comes to a comparison with the other city that you mentioned in your comment, the royal city, Ciudad Real, there's not a lot of difference. The main difference being that Albacete has just under 200,000 people that I mentioned before, whereas Ciudad Real would have less than 100,000 people, so a fair bit smaller. But they're both attractive cities in the La Mancha region here in Spain. And another difference, which is important, is that Albacete is closer to the coast. One here from Bill, I knew there was a man of La Mancha, didn't realize there was a New York. Yeah, Bill, thanks for the comment and also referring to my Albacete video because Albacete has been called in the past the New York of La Mancha. Apparently back in the day, a couple of hundred years ago, a famous writer saw similarities between the two cities, but I don't think you can compare modern day Albacete with modern day New York. And an interesting fact is that the name La Mancha is not only a region here in Spain, but it's also what the Spanish call the English Channel. They call it the Canal de la Mancha. So remember that just in case it pops up as a trivial pursuit question. One here from Ken, would be great if you could get Albert from the YouTube channel Spain on a Fork to do a live stream with you. Since your viewers are interested in Spain, I bet they are also interested in authentic Spanish dishes. Plus, he was born and lives in Valencia, but raised in California, 
Excellent recipes. Yeah, Ken, thanks for the comment and thanks for the suggestion. And I will definitely check out the channel Spain on a Fork. It'll be interesting to see what type of recipes he's whipping up on that channel. And it would be good to take a look at some of his authentic Spanish dishes. So thanks for pointing that channel out. One here from David, camper vans in Tenerife. There are lots of places to park up. You don't see so many because it costs over 2K on the ferry. Yeah, David, thanks for the comment and replying to a comment that was posted on the channel a couple of days ago by someone who was wondering why they don't see many camper vans in places like Tenerife down there in the Canary Islands, especially when you compare it to mainland Spain, which is absolutely crawling with camper vans. And the reason why there's not many camper vans seen in the Canary Islands, not for a lack of parking, but because of the cost to take them there. Around 2,000 pounds or euros, as stated by David in that comment. And for a lot of people, obviously, it's just not worth the cost. One here from IEDC04, UK tabloids will never let the truth get in the way of a good headline. They lived on Brexit rhetoric but now realize that Project Fear is actually Project Reality and are looking for other targets for their lies. Yeah, thanks for the comment. And this is related to an article or a couple of articles that we saw in yesterday's live stream about how the Balearic Islands tourism minister is in hot water at the moment because of comments she made about British tourism in places like Mallorca. According to The Sun, The Mirror and some other tabloids there in the UK, the tourism minister was quoted as saying that they don't want low quality British tourism anymore in the islands. She said they're looking to raise the quality of tourism in places like Mallorca, Menorca and Ibiza and that some British tourists should head straight to places like Greece and Turkey and not come to the Balearic Islands. Her comments made headlines throughout the United Kingdom and they were picked up here in Spain by some press outlets. And the opposition party in the Balearic Islands, the Partido Popular, is asking her to explain exactly what she said. But according to her, the British press misinterpreted her words and she didn't say anything along those lines. So who's telling the truth? The British tabloids or the Balearic Islands tourism minister? I don't know, but given the reputation of those tabloids, as you point out in your comment, I know who I would be trusting. And finally, one here from Knight and King. Greece is the place to go, guys. Tourism director didn't get it wrong she's just backtracking six drinks a day what a joke your knight and king thanks for the comment and there we go thanks for setting it straight the british tabloids have got it right the tourism minister has got it wrong and many britons like yourself are going to head to greece or turkey for the next holidays so many people if that last comment is anything to go by do believe what the British tabloid press say. On that note, I'll wrap the video up. Questions and comments, please leave them in the section below. Debate the video out as you normally do. Give it a thumbs up if you liked it. Thumbs down if you didn't. I'll see you in the next one. Hasta luego.